What good is your worship doing? It is honoring God when this world is dishonoring him. It is honoring God when the devil is lying to you. It is honoring God. You know, what good is your worship doing? Let me tell you how good your worship is doing. Your worshiping is silencing the enemy. Your worshiping is putting chains on the enemy's hands and chains on the enemy's feet. Have you ever felt like giving up? I know I have, and I know what that feels like. And that's one of the strongholds Satan tries to use to destroy our lives, trying to get us to, to give up, trying to get us to quit. And I was so discouraged at one point in my life, I thought the discouragement would never end. And that's when God showed me the source of discouragement and the feelings of wanting to give up and quit came from certain lies that the devil was telling me. And it's those same lies that he tells just about every one of us. The devil would tell me, you're not going to make it through this, so why try? He would plant wrong thoughts in my mind to convince me that, hey, you'd al you've already blown it. You're not good enough. You're hopeless. You'll never recover. You know, he condemns you about your marriage, about your divorce, about your kids, about your boss, about yourself. He tells us that God doesn't care and it's never going to get better. But remember what the Bible says. The devil is the father of lies, so none of his lies are true. And you know, the truth is, we don't have to defeat the devil. He's already been defeated. What we need to do is to defeat his lies, to pull down his strongholds today and conquer the lies that feed the discouragement in our lives. You know what's going to happen when you pull down those strongholds? You're going to breathe easier. You're going to look up. You're going to feel hope and faith again. Are you ready for that? I know you are. So here it comes. Get ready. Check this out. Go over with me to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, and I want to show you the five lies that the enemy is trying to get us to believe, the five lies that are trying to build a stronghold of deception in your life and get you to quit. Now, it's really important that we understand Satan is trying to get you to quit. It's Satan behind the, 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 the thoughts that are coming to you that want you to quit. And there are five of them in, this pa in these passages we're going to go through quickly. There are five of them that want to get us to give up. Now, I want you to see in the King James Bible of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3. In fact, go over there real quick, and then we'll come back to Nehemiah. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 3, Satan's goal is to get you to give up. See, he can't defeat you uh, through his power, so he gets you to quit. And let me show you how he gets you to quit or give up or faint. It says, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. We don't faint in our bodies first, we faint in our minds. We don't quit in our bodies, we quit in our minds. Exercise is, doesn't... Exercise is not something that uh, people, people don't resist physical exercise. They resist the mental exhaustion that comes from physical exercise. It's the battle of your mind, even if you want to lose weight, even if you want to get in shape, even if you want to go, uh, go to a gym or, get, or work out or exercise. It's mental. It's mental. Your body is capable of persisting. Your body is capable of running or walking or jumping or leaping or lifting weights. Your body is capable of doing that within reason, but your mind is where you give up first. Your mind is where you give up in your marriage first. Your mind is where you give up in your health first. Your mind is where you give up in your diet first. You don't give up with the hand reaching for the food. You give up in your head seeing images of lollipops and seeing images of chicken dinners and seeing images of cotton candy or seeing images of ice cream and, and seeing images of all this food. And then your hands reach out for what you are seeing and imagining in your head. We give up in our mind. That's why he says we faint in our mind. And this is why we need to gird up the loins of our mind, the Bible says. We need to gird up the, the, the belt of our mind. And that's how we resist the lies of the enemy. But back to Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. 
So what happens is Babylon has taken Israel captive. Babylon has, has taken control of the children of Israel. But in the midst of Babylon, God speaks to Nehemiah and he tells him to build the wall. He tells him, I want you to rebuild the wall of Jerusalem and begin to separate yourself from Babylon and separate yourself from the Babylonian control. So Babylon, Babylon has taken the Jews into captivity. And in the midst of that, in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1, God speaks to Nehemiah. And the whole chapter before that, chapter 1 and chapter 2 and chapter 3, he tells them, here's what I want you to do. Here's how I want you to build the wall. And here's, here's how fast I want you to get it done in. But as soon as he decides to build the wall, and as soon as he starts building the wall, and building the wall, rebuilding this wall, is you and me rebuilding our lives. And we rebuild our lives from the inside out. No matter what failure has come, no matter what defeat has come, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter how far your life is off course, God says he wants us to rebuild our lives. And we rebuild our lives by rebuilding the wall. We tear down the walls of strongholds that are imprisoning us, and then we rebuild the walls of God's promises that protect us. And this is what God's called each of us to do. So this is a picture of the Christian life. God gets us saved and we start coming to a church that is teaching us God's word. And what does the devil do? He begins to mock you. He begins to get angry at the progress you're making. The wall starts going up. You start believing that you are who God said you are. You start believing that you're the head and not the tail. You start believing that God's on your side. You start believing that you're, that you're, that you're blessed coming in and blessed going out. And Satan gets furious. He hates that you're building brick upon brick. You're building upon 2 Corinthians 5, 17. You're a new creature in Christ. And you're building on Romans 5, 17 that, that through, the, through the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, you reign in life. And you're building upon Romans 8, 37. You're more than a conqueror because of his love. And you're building on Romans 8, 39 that nothing can separate you from the love of God. And as you build your life upon the bricks of God's promises and build a wall of protection that no weapon formed against you can prosper, no evil can come near your dwelling place, no plague can come near your tent, you start building brick upon brick. This is what's making the devil mad. This is why the devil didn't want you to come to church today. This is why the devil didn't want you to go to church in this place. Because he doesn't mind you going to a church that's not handing you bricks, but we're handing you bricks and we're giving you bricks. And whoa, whoa, there's one brick on Romans 12, 2, renew your mind. And another brick on Romans 5, 17. And another brick on Romans 3, 20. And there's an Ephesians 4, 14 brick. And there's a 1 Corinthians 6, 16 brick. And there's a Galatians chapter 3, verse 13 brick that you're redeemed from the curse of the law. And the devil hates that you are being given bricks in this place to build your wall against him. That's why Satan attacks churches that are teaching the Bible. That's why Satan attacks. When we came out with fasting from wrong thinking a few years ago, God gave me this idea to fast from wrong thinking. And I can tell you this, I have not faced more opposition in my life than when we started talking about fasting from wrong thinking. I got, got hit with everything, whether it was financial attacks, emotional attacks, attacks against my family, attacks against our church, attacks against our, every area of our, of our lives. Why? Because Satan is furious. Notice what it says. When it came to pass, when Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became furious. This is the picture of the devil. He's furious that you're here today. He's furious that you got another brick in your hand. And he wants you to use that brick to throw it at another Christian. And God wants you to use that brick to build your wall. Come on, are you hearing this? He, he became furious and very angry. And he began to try to get the people to give up with the lies that he begins to speak. And this is exactly what is happening in your life. Satan sees that you're rebuilding your life upon God's word. You're rebuilding your life upon the promises of God. Does this make sense to anybody? And he, and he says, you know what? No way. I'm not going to let him do it. So he begins to speak these lies. Because if, if he can get you to believe his five lies, he'll get you to quit. He'll, you'll put down your bricks and you'll walk away from the wall. But we've got to stay at the wall We've got to maintain our position at the wall. We've got to keep putting more bricks into the wall because Satan wants us to put down our bricks and God wants us to, to connect our bricks and stay faithful to believe what God says and continue to expose the lies of the enemy. What are they? Verse 2. 
Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. I'm sharing this from the New American Standard Bible because I think it identifies these five lives most accurately. The first one is he says this. So he spoke in the presence of his brothers and the wealthy men of Samaria, and he said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? Can they offer worship and sacrifices? Can they finish in a day? Can they revive the stones from the dusty rubble, even the burned ones? Notice how Satan comes with a question mark. He's always questioning God's word, questioning the bricks, questioning what God can do in your life. Did God really say not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil? He's always coming with questions, questioning the Bible, questioning God's word. The Pharisees always questioned Jesus. Who gave you this authority? Where'd you come from? Who'd you, who gave you this power? Where'd you learn this? We know who your parents are. We know who your sisters are. We know who your brothers are. Where did you get this kind of power? Where did you get this kind of authority? Satan's always asking questions to get you to doubt his, God's word. And the first one is, what are these feeble Jews doing? What does he mean by this? Well, lie number one is you don't have what it takes. You're feeble. You're weak. You don't have the strength to make it all the way. Who do you think you are? You're not strong enough to make it. You're not strong enough to rebuild your life. You're weak. You can't make it. You don't have what it takes. Well, how do we deal with this lie? Lie number one that says you don't have what it takes. You're weak. We need to deal with that with the scripture. The Bible says, I am strong in the Lord and the power of his might, Ephesians 6.10. The Bible says, greater is he that is in me than he is in the world, 1 John 4.4. 4. And the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me, Philippians 4.13. What do you do with these lies? You, you, you contradict these lies with the truth. You counteract these lies with the truth of God's word. And Satan is always coming in the form of people. He's always coming in the form of a person named Sanballat, or he comes in the form of your husband, or he comes in the form. Now listen, here's what we've got to understand. When Jesus said to his disciples, I'm going to the cross, I'm going to die for the sins of, of I'm going to die for your sins and the sins of mankind, Peter pulls him aside and begins to rebuke him and says, no, Lord, you're not going to do that. And Jesus looks to Peter and says, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Notice he didn't say, get behind me, Peter. Jesus saw through this lie, and he spoke to the enemy behind it. We've got to stop thinking that our battle is against flesh and blood. These feeble Jews, these, you're weak, you're never going to make it. Lie number two, are they going to restore it for themselves? Lie number two is, you have a wrong motive. You're selfish. You only want to be blessed because you're selfish and you're greedy. And all these Christians are greedy and selfish. You just need enough for yourself. But no, it was God's idea to bless you. He said, I want to bless you so you can be a blessing. You can't be a blessing if you don't become a vessel of receiving God's blessing. You will not be able to give God's blessing to others. God blesses us so that we can be a blessing. And the devil wants to tell you, oh, you have a wrong motive. You just want more so that you can, you know, so that you can have it for your yourself, you're selfish, you're, you're greedy, you have a, a wrong idea of God. But no, folks, it was God's idea to save you more. God wanted to save you more than you wanted to be saved. God wants to heal you more than you want to be healed. God wants to bless you more than you want to be blessed. We got to realize the promises of God were God's idea. If you hold on to all 7,000 of God's promises, you would not have a wrong motive. It is not bad. It is not selfish. God wants to do more in your life so you can do more, and he can do more through your life. Amen. Can anybody say amen? to that. I'm telling you folks, the devil is a liar and he wants, and because if he can get you to think, oh, you can't ask God for that because you're being selfish, then you'll never ask God for anything. Because do you really need anything? I mean, you're not starving. I know we say, oh, I'm starving. What? You just ate three hours ago and you're like, oh, I'm starving. You're not really starving. And the fact is, is if you really starve to death, You'd go to heaven and you'd live forever in eternity. So we got to stop being afraid of what might happen in our lives and start having faith and expectation. But the point is, is the devil wants you to think, oh, if you ask God for that, you're being selfish. If you ask God for that, you're being selfish. God has given us 7,000 promises for us to ask so that he can be glorified. He said, ask and you shall receive that your father will be glorified and your joy may be made full. God wants to answer your prayer so that he can be glorified 
It's not selfish to ask God. It's not selfish. What are these feeble Jews doing? Are they going to restore it for themselves? You're only doing it for yourself. Folks, we have to take care of ourselves so that we can love ourselves, so we can love others as ourselves. We have to take care of ourselves so we can be healthy and we can take care. If you're sick and if you're broke and if you're hurting and suffering and, un, and, for, and bitter and unforgiving all the days of your life, you, can't, you are of no good to anybody. You're blessed to be a blessing. So we need to pull down that thought, that lie, that stronghold. Number three, he says, are they going to try to worship and can they offer, can they really offer worship and sacrifices? He's questioning whether you can worship. And you know what this lie is? This is lie number three. You can't worship God. It's not doing any good. You can't worship God. Look at the sin in your life. You can't lift your hands. Put your hands down. You're, put your hands down. You can't worship God. You don't deserve to worship God. And the devil's trying to lie to you and say, you haven't done enough. You're not holy enough. You're not godly enough. Put your hands down. You can't sing good enough. You can't praise enough. Look at what you did. Oh, you're going to glorify God now, but you know you were, cussing me. you were cussing somebody out yesterday. Look at your life. Look at your past. Look at all the things you've done wrong. Put your hands down. You're not worthy of worship. You know what, devil? You're right. I'm not worthy of worship, but Jesus is worthy of my worship. And I'm worshiping him because he's washed me in his blood. I'm worshiping him because he's forgiven me of my sins. I'm worshiping him anyway. Well, what good is your worship going to do? So the devil will say, your worship isn't going to do any good, so don't, don't get there early, don't get there on time, come late, miss the songs, miss the worship, because it doesn't matter. What good will your worship do, Satan says? What good will your worship do? What good will our worship do? Well, let's ask Paul and Silas, what good did their worship do? As they worshiped God, the prison began to shake, the walls began to shake, the prison doors began to open, the chains came off of their hands and feet. What is your worship going to do? What good does your worship do? Why don't we ask Jehoshaphat in 2 Chronicles 20 when he sent out the praisers and as they praised God, the enemy routed each other. What good is your worship going to do? What good is your worship going to do? Why don't we ask uh, Abraham when he said, we're going to go and worship the Lord. And while he was worshiping God, a ram was caught in the thicket and God provided for the sins of mankind and said, because you offered me your son in worship, I'm going to offer you my son for the sins of all mankind. What good is your worship? Why don't we ask? <laughs> what good is your worship? Why don't we ask the people that marched around the wall of Jericho seven times and then they blew the trumpet of praise and worship and the wall came tumbling down? What good is your worship? Let me tell you something. Your worship is so good. It silences the devil. Your worship is so good. It opens the prison doors. Your worship is so good. It causes Satan to tremble in his feet, at his feet. Let me tell you something. How good is your worship? What good is your worship doing? Why don't we ask Habakkuk in chapter 3, verse 17, though there be no fruit, yet I will praise him. I will rejoice in the Lord anyway, and the harvest begins to come. What good is your worship going to do? Though someone's against me, yet I will praise him. What good is your worship going to do? Though that my body is hurting, yet I will praise him. What good is your worship going to do? Though hell is waging war against me, yet I will worship him. How, what good is your worship going to do? Your worship puts your mind right. Your worship puts your body right. Your worship is offering to the Lord a living sacrifice which honors him. When we present our bodies, we are presenting a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God. What good is your worship doing? It is honoring God when this world is dishonoring him. It is honoring God when the devil is lying to you. It is honoring God. You know, what good is your worship doing? Let me tell you how good your worship is doing. Your worshiping is silencing the enemy. Your worshiping is putting chains on the enemy's hands and chains on the enemy's feet. What good is your worship doing? What good is your worship doing? I wonder, how, I wonder what, your, what your worship is doing. Let me read something to you. Psalm 50, Psalm 149, I believe it is. Psalm 149. What good is your worship doing? What good is your praise? Shut up. Silence yourself. Shut, put your hands down, the devil says. No. No, devil. We're not listening to you anymore. We're not listening to your lies anymore. We're taking those thoughts captive to the obedience of Christ. Psalm, Psalm 149 says in verse Six, let the high praises of God be in our mouth and a two-edged sword in our hands to execute vengeance on the nations, punishment on the peoples, which we're, our battle isn't against flesh and blood, so it's punishment upon the demons and the forces of darkness. 
to bind the kings with chains and their nobles with fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written. Every time you praise God, it is judging a demon. Every time you praise God, it is silencing a devil. Every time you praise God, it is silencing the enemy. What good does your worship do? The devil wants you. What good is your worship doing? The devil keeps wanting to question you, question your worship. What good is that? What good is coming to church on time and lifting your hands? What good is singing a song that's not even your favorite song? What good is your worship doing? It's honoring God because you're not here to honor yourself. You're here to honor Jesus Christ. You're here to glorify him. We're here to worship and adore him. Lie number four, lie number four, the enemy says, oh, he says, shall they finish in a day? We're in Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 2. Shall they finish in a day? What does the devil mean by that? You're never going to finish. You're never going to last. You don't have what it takes to finish. Shall they finish in a day? Well, the good news is, is that you don't have to finish what you started because he who began a good work in you, he will finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. How do you deal with this lie? Can you even finish? You're not going to finish on time. You're not going to make it. It's not going to happen. Well, we don't have to finish in a day. God is the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1 and 2 says, you'll never finish. The devil is trying to tell you, you're never going to finish. But God says, I started this in your life. I'll finish it. Just keep speaking God's word. And five, will you try to revive the stones and the heaps of rubbish when they're already been burned? Even the burned ones. What is the devil saying here? What lie is he telling us? The lie he's telling us here is it's too late. Your life is too ruined. Your life is too far gone. You've already blown it too bad. You're too burned. You're too scorched. It's too late for you. Really? Was it too late for the thief on the cross while he was dying? When he said, remember me, Lord, when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said, this day you shall be with me in paradise. Was it too late for Abraham when he was 99 years old and God gave him a son named Isaac? Was it too late for Sarah when he was, she was 90 years old and God gave her a son named Isaac? Was it too late for David after he had committed adultery and committed murder and lied to cover it all up? And God ended up turning his life around and he became a man after God's own heart and finished the purpose of God for his generation. Was it too late for David? Was it too late for Saul of Tarsus who was murderous threats were coming out of his mouth? He was putting Christians in prison. He, he, he rejoiced at the suffering and the death of other of Christians because he thought that it was a good thing that he was doing for God to get rid of the Christians in the world? Was it too late for him? No, he became the Apostle Paul and wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He wrote Ephesians, Philippians, uh, Colossians, Galatians. He wrote First and Second Corinthians. He wrote uh, Romans. He wrote uh, uh, the book of Hebrews, most likely. He wrote First and Second Timothy and, and Titus and, and um, all these books in the Scripture. Paul wrote these Scriptures. Is it too late for him? Was his life too burned? Was Rahab the harlot, was she too far gone when God used her to save the nation of Israel and the walls came tumbling down in Jericho because she told about the spies that were coming in to defeat the children of Israel and God protected them through a prostitute, God protected them through a harlot, was it too late for her? She's written about in the book of Hebrews now. She's written about in the book of Hebrews. It's not too late. Your life is not too burned. God is not finished with you. Silence the lies of the enemy and begin to believe that God is going to finish what he started in your life and it's not too late for you because it wasn't too late for them and God is no respecter of persons. We are over time, but praise God, we kicked a field goal and we win. Let's stand together. Well, now you've learned the lies the devil uses to get you to quit and it's time to pull down those strongholds and take authority over those lies. It is never too late to see things get better in your life. It's your time. And the way we do that is by thinking God's thoughts and speaking his words. That's when Jesus finishes what he started in your life. And I want to encourage you, click the link below to go to my website and download an audio copy of this entire message to save to your computer, tablet, or other device. And don't forget to subscribe to this channel and connect with me on Facebook to stay up to date with my latest teachings and more exclusive content. And I want to hear from you. Comment below or send me a message on Facebook, email me. Let me know how this teaching helped you take your authority back and take your life back. And listen, one last thought. God knows what you're going through and how to get you through it. So trust him today. Walk in your God-given authority and everything's going to be all right. Don't ever forget, God's not mad at you. He's mad about you. Don't miss our next video. I can't wait to see you then. God bless.